This week in games, Ubisoft pulls out of E3, Multiverses is getting shut down, and we review Resident Evil 4. This is the Two Penny Games Cast. What's poppin' players? Welcome back to the Two Penny Games Cast, episode 140. I am your host, Tavin Bothell, here with my good friend and co-host, say hello to the people, Connor Elliott. How you doing? This feels weird because it's it's a different day. It yeah. is a different day. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't know, we usually record on Sundays uh, and have this episode out to you every Monday at 8 a.m. Central at youtube.com slash at 2 gamescast or mainstream podcast services of your choice. However, uh, I got a little sick. I was a little sicky-wicky yesterday. Uh, it came down with some type of stomach virus, Connor. I woke up at 6.30 in the morning and just vomited my guts out. And then uh, drank some water. And then at about 10 o'clock, I think, again, just kept kept vomiting and vomiting. And then I spent the entire day in bed because I was just – I don't know what happened. I just got uh, the wind knocked out of me. And I'm still, I'm still not 100%. I still feel it. Particularly my chest doesn't feel too good right now. And uh, my head gets a little uh, woozy sometimes. So while I'm reading stories and while I'm commenting, please forgive me if it takes me a second to, to collect my thoughts. Um, well, as far as the intro goes, you're, you're going over it very well. Hey, man, you're... I'm trying my best. <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing what I can here, uh, yeah. lightheadedness aside. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't know, every week, me and Connor come to you every Monday at 8 a.m. Central Time, like I said, youtube.com slash at 2 games and mainstream podcast services of your choice to give you the new news in the video game industry. We each come to you with two topics, two pennies, if you will, and we give you our two cents on them. A benefit of being a day late, Connor, is uh, we, now get to, <laughs> we now get to cover today's news, Monday's news, which we're you know, usually quite behind on, so. Yeah, and we're always, we always have like the worst habit of the story being like a really interesting one the day yeah. after we record this podcast. Yeah, so. uh, and from what I from record. what I gather from other news-centric podcasts and stuff, uh, that's just always the case. They, they, they always have that problem where they're like, well, we record on Mondays or we record on Thursdays and then PlayStation drops a news thing on the day after or whatever. So I've just, I remember the most annoying part was when the Series X got a, revealed or announced the day after, like literally like, 20 minutes before a podcast went up uh the series i think it was the series s which is the smaller version of the x got announced or revealed or something and i was like come on guys like mm -hmm. you couldn't have done this a day early <laughs> giving us something to talk about because by the time sunday rolls around again that's old news you know but ladies and gentlemen we are here with the new news today speaking of which something that dropped just today ubisoft seems to be leaving e3 uh, this is going to be my first penny of the day. Our first topic of the day. Let's jump straight into this VGC article uh, by Andy Robbins. Excuse me. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Ubisoft is no longer attending E3 2023 and will host its own event in June. Ubisoft is no longer attending this year's physical E3 event, VGC Understands. Last month, the Assassin's Creed publisher became the first major company to publicly commit to attending the revamped E3, which is due to take place in June at its traditional venue of the Los Angeles Convention Center. However, in a statement issued to VGC, the company said it has now decided to move in a different direction and will instead be holding its own Ubisoft Forward live event on June 12th in Los Angeles. Quote, E3 has fostered unforgettable moments across the industry throughout the years, a spokesperson told VGC, quote, while we initially intended to have an official E3 presence, we've made the subsequent decision to move in a different direction, and we'll be holding a Ubisoft Forward live event on June 12th in Los Angeles. We look forward to sharing more details with our players very soon. E3 organizer Reed Pop did not immediately respond to a request for comment. E3 2023, the flagship industry events, first physical show in four years is due to run from tuesday june 13th and has been taken over uh from the entertainment software association by read pop the media and events company behind pax egx and star wars celebration so we're leaving the ship we're, we're, another one another one bites the dust you know uh quote unquote so 
earlier this year, we got news that the big three, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, will not be attending E3. And now Ubisoft also seems to, to be pulling out as well uh, to in favor of their own Ubisoft forward. Um, there's, I think, a couple of different ways to look at this. Firstly being, uh, it's just kind of a sign of the times. A lot of these publishers are seeing that it makes a lot more sense for them to host their own events on their own schedules. This way they don't have to rush necessarily for E3 to put together some type of presentation that maybe a game isn't ready for or uh, they're, they're just not willing to fully commit to yet. They can now kind of run at their own schedule. Obviously not fully their own schedule. It still seems to be, a, it's a pretty good pace of like have something in the summer around E3 season instead of the E3 event and have something closer to the winter time around um, the game awards and so forth. Uh, and of course, summer event with uh, Jeff Keighley's Summer Games Fest. So I, I think Nintendo has for years had their Nintendo Directs and has worked really well with them. Sometimes it's a, the Direct is a part of E3. Sometimes it's just, you know, off to the side around that same week or weekend. Uh, PlayStation has done the same thing for the last couple of years now with their own either PlayStation showcases or state of plays, depending on whatever they have ready to, to go by the time E3 season comes around. Xbox is new to the party, leaving E3. Uh, and I guess we're just going to get kind of their own thing. Granted... They, they had left E3 last year, but had done a uh, showcase within Summer Games Fest, uh, which both you and I, Connor, reacted to last year, and you can go check out that old reaction on the channel now. Would you? <laughs> that video actually did pretty well. A lot of people liked the Persona bit, uh, where, <laughs> where we reacted to Persona coming to Xbox, which was huge. Um, and then there, there's the dramatic thing of, like, E3 is kind of going the way of the Dodo. Like, it's slowly but surely losing its relevance. Now, will it ever fully go away? I don't know. Maybe eventually in 10 years' time, but it's not something that I think will die in the next... Like, next year, E3 will still be around. It's just now E3 has competition with Summer Games Fest, with each individual publisher themselves. Um, which I think a lot of these publishers are realizing that, hey... Like, E3 is cool because all of the people are in one building. All of the news people are in one building and can talk to us. But now with the explosion of the internet, it actually just makes sense to just release all the news on our own day. So we can just show everybody what we have at the same time. And then uh, all the journalists and, and insiders can come in and have our behind closed doors demos played, you know, wherever we are at the time. We don't necessarily need a huge presence on the E3 show floor, for example, which is expensive. Um, so, yeah, Connor, where, where are you with this? You know, the truth of the matter is that they're just sheep. They're just following the big dogs. They're just going and like, oh, this time to leave now? Yes, it is. And then they march off. I mean, it's Ubisoft. They even their their own, their segments at E3 were always some of the most boring they had one good one with Assassin's Creed uh, <coughs> Odyssey. I remember that whole segment being good. But other than that, I don't really recall there ever being one really even worth watching. So them leaving, it's it's not as important as the, the other big three. And as you said, Tevin, it's basically the, they're just going to release it on their own time through their own methods. Their own, uh, their games that aren't doing all that well. And that's just what they're going to tell us on Twitter. I mean, I, I don't I don't agree that they have less interesting showcases. Uh, I think they're just less interesting to you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean... No, I mean, I don't... I, I just think... I think a lot of these publishers just realize that it's just better to do it on their own. Or better to um, bring the eyes to themselves as opposed to ask to be a part of the conversation uh, with these big showcases like E3 and so forth. These showcases are still great for getting a lot of eyes and a lot of attention on your stuff, but they don't necessarily uh, give us, you know, as much focus. Like, when you're just off on your own and you can pick your day, you have the day. Like, you know, you look back at the latest Nintendo Direct or the latest PlayStation State of Play. They ran the news cycle for that day. It was nothing but them. Why share that space with your competitors uh, and, you know... You would often see like three showcases in one day, 
why share that space? And by the, if you're at the end of the day, people are tired and not paying as much attention and not giving you as much energy. Why do that when you could just, hey, let's just go a day early. What happens if we just go a day early? And, oh, we get much more traction and reception because we have an entire day and uh, the Twitter feeds get buzzing a lot more when our stories are not buried under whatever new PlayStation exclusive is happening. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Not to mention, I, I'm not very familiar with the uh, the monetary side of E3, So, I, I, but it, to me it seems like they end up paying money to be here and to set up their stalls rather than be paid to be there. Yeah, so maybe there's a. I'm assuming there's a cost to performing at E3, and, and you know when you when you can just remove that barrier, you're just saving money at that point. Just for and also as you said, combined with the fact that you're not having to share it with your competitors, you're you know saving money and possibly getting more eyes on just your stuff as opposed to somebody else's. Though I, admittedly, that might not be true because I don't know if they get money out of it or whatnot. You have to you have to pay to be there. You have to mm -hmm. to, to right. be on the floor. You have to you have to pay for that seating and stuff um and then it but you know at the same time like you know it, it still costs money to put out these presentations and put out these showcases these ubisoft forwards and so forth but i'm sure it just costs a hell of a lot less because you don't have to worry about real estate you don't have to worry about marketing you don't have to worry about advertise or uh, uh floor space or just aesthetic you know uh i remember when breath of the wild was popping up nintendo paid for uh, their space and then built like a whole legend of zelda breath of the wild exhibit that you could walk around into and yeah sure all of that's cool but does just a really cool video with a green screen get a get across the same effect probably you know um just more eyes on it because i can't go in that wonderland of a breath of the wild thing i'm not there yeah like, most the, people aren't there so it's not really doing all that much in terms of once again getting eyes on anything yeah, and then, the, I mean, the biggest difference is, is with E3 specifically is it's not meant for people like us who don't go to these events and just watch the showcases from our home. Like, yeah, okay, now we're not watching E3s anymore. We're watching their own things. But E3 is really meant for the insiders who go in and play the demos and so forth. So that is going to be a little different. But um, I think in terms of marketing and so forth, a lot of this is just going to kind of be the same. Um Speaking to, to Ubisoft specifically, which has been in a tricky place these last couple of years, Connor, what do you think this means for their lineup this year? It's, I'm going to be honest. What is their lineup from this year? Because uh, Creed game, I remember they... Yeah, they it, it's, it's looking pretty slim right now. Uh, yeah. So Assassin's Creed Mirage is their next Assassin's mm -hmm. Creed up, and you would assume we, we see that in its full glory. I would assume, especially if they're looking at a release this year because I, I i thought i heard that it was supposed to come last year but i guess it just didn't or maybe it's because they expanded it because it was just going to be a dlc uh and they expanded it into a full game that they took another year to, to to continue to continue to develop it um so i assume that's coming uh at their forward um so I, I, I list skull and bones probably is their next thing maybe a far cry spinoff title uh, kevin you're beginning about a game that very well, much well, may come out and save them. If you're talking about Beyond Good and Evil 2, I swear to God. <laughs> what if What if it does come out and it's like this amazing, revolutionary thing? I'm, gonna be honest, <laughs> I'm, looking, at, I'm looking at their list. It's just games that have been doing bad. Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time remake. Oh my God, I forgot <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of it looks like Project U. Okay, it looks cool. Lunar Cell remake, but they've shown nothing of it. They That's not going to be there. It's like... That's not gonna be here close. I guess they did Lego Star Wars, did they? Uh no, that's a that's a Every, that's, that's, yeah, TT no, no. games. Um, yeah, so you're right. mistake. Connor, get get a little bit more up on your microphone for me, my friend. Oh god. <laughs> I can turn it up. I turned oh. it up. Is it like... Oh wow, yeah. You're yeah, you're up there now. Am I too loud? Or it's am fine. I good? It's okay. Fine. I'm gonna normalize all the peaks in editing anyway. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, like, I don't see the lineup being superb this year as it is. Is Just Dance still a thing? Just Dance is still a thing, right? Um, maybe with a VR mode or something. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I, I mean, I feel like I haven't seen it in a little while, but that's also because I, I black out anytime Just Dance comes on screen and I just like, you know, zone out and, you know, are left alone with my dark intrusive thoughts of, uh, depression for the next five minutes. Huh. I just like uh I just kind of space out. Instead of doing that. 
<laughs> I mean, you should learn to space out, Tav. I should. That's probably a healthier mindset to be in. Cleanse your mind of any thought. It might have ramifications, but don't think about them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if it necessarily means anything in terms of their lineup, them leaving E3, but it's definitely like a, oh, okay, well, what do you have? Like, if it's still enough for y'all to do something, which I'm sure because of uh, investors and so forth that they still have to have some kind of news drop around this time. Um, but, like, what do you guys have? Because I don't know if you guys have a lot. And, you know, you did an, uh, an Assassin's Creed showcase late last year. I don't think Assassin's Creed is going to be enough. If you just give me 20 minutes of Assassin's Creed, I'm going to want to blow my brains out, you know? Um, they really are hinging a lot on Assassin's Creed. They're doing a lot of that stuff. It's basically it's basically their their only revenue source right now. Like, I I think Valhalla kept them alive for a while. And, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's... It's a little rough, but I mean, you know, they still they have some plan for the division. Are they, how, when's the last time something came out? Oh that? Jesus, man! Part There's man. a bunch for the division. There's supposed to be a mobile game that has <laughs> that never came out. Uh, there was supposed to be like a bunch of stuff, some more expansion stuff. Um, that team is working on the Star Wars game though, so maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we get an early look at that. I'm talking a teaser trailer um, that like it. it just shows some like uh cg animated uh rebel soldiers blasting stormtroopers and then a guy with a lightsaber pops out and that's it um i think i think it'd be strong for the i think it'd be smart for them to do that but let's see if they even do that connor i think that's yeah, about yeah. i think that's about it for the ubisoft story here so let's go ahead and jump Done with into, ubisoft move on move on let's jump into our second story of the day your first penny if you want to go ahead and jump it from here what do we got well let me look on my uh, new second monitor oh uh, we're upgrading glenn. everybody little bit by little bit we're getting upgrades out here thank you glenn uh so this is a new update from uh, multiverses some big new changes hi everyone this is tony from player first games i'm here on today i have the entire multiverses team to say thank you for your support during our open beta we've been excited to see the interest and enthusiasm from the community and your feedback is invaluable we continue to be humbled by the awards the game has received fighting game of the year uh and excited to see the enjoyment that multiverses has brought to players throughout our open beta we've been working hard to build the best gameplay experience and we appreciate all of the inspiration you've given us our open beta has been an important learning opportunity for us and a stepping stone to the next phase of multiverses we know there's still a lot of work to do as a result we have a clearer view of what we need to focus on Spe specifically uh, the content cadence of new characters, maps, and modes to give you more ways to enjoy the game, along with updated netcode and more matchmaking improvements. We'll also be reworking the progression system based on your feedback and looking at new ways for you to connect with your friends in the game. To this, uh, to do this the right way, we will be closing the Multiverses Open Beta on June 25th, 2023. As part of this process, we'll be pausing updates and taking the game offline as we prepare for the launch of Multiverses, which we are targeting for early 2024. I'm sure you're wondering what this means for you. During this downtime, all online modes and features will be unavailable. Uh, you will have limited offline access to the training room, known as the lab, <laughs> so cool, and local matches along with access to your characters and cosmetic items within these modes. We, didn't, we do know that this news might be disappointing to the people that spent a bunch of money, uh, but rest <laughs> assured, Multiverses will be back. We'll also ensure that all of your progress and content will carry over after you already paid for it when Multiverses returns next year with a variety of new content, features, and modes. Along the way, we're providing updates to keep on blah, blah, blah. Screw you. Wow, okay. <laughs> Just full-on editorializing there at the end. Okay, yeah, so Multiverses, Multiverses is closing down in June and hope, hopefully opening back up in 2024. We'll see. Um, but, I mean, you can still play it offline, which I think is the right way to go. They say they're keeping all of your... Uh, everything you've unlocked and 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 paid for and built out uh in the beta you will have access to in uh the final game which is a good point um but uh connor you seem to have some feelings about this well i don't play the game i know people that do yeah it's ultimately just disappointed that money was spent on this game it was an open beta but it wasn't treated as a thing that would leave like it it, it branded itself as an ongoing game and everyone's it, it, but it never officially broke out of that beta li license uh, title. So they you know, knew that they still had an out, which they 
obviously took because people have lost interest in their game. And the problem is, is that people who still want to play it might not be able to anymore, or at least not as well as it used to run, because people will lose interest. This is a game where it, for all intents and purposes, was out. Everyone treated it as out, and it was just waiting for more content. But instead of giving us more content, being in that phase of uh, uh, your game, you're just starting over from scratch. It's just, it's risky, at least. You know, I guess I, I can give them that, but it, it's still pretty unfair to the people that spent all that time and, more specifically, money, even though it was free to download uh, in the game and then have it just gone in the way that made it worthwhile, which is playing online. Yeah, I mean... I, I don't think any I don't think people were like gathering around uh, uh, their friends' couches to play multiverses as mm -hmm. much as like say a Smash Brothers. Where like I don't think of Smash Brothers as an online game. I think of it as a game that you play with with people together. Multiverses is the opposite. Like I'm not loading up multiverses when I have all my friends over. I'm loading up Smash Brothers. But when we're all out doing our separate things, or you know we all find ourselves with an afternoon, yeah, I'll play some I'll play some multiverses. Whatever if you want, sure. Uh, the thing is, is, is that, I mean, the, I mean, we're in the wild, wild west right now as in terms of like how online multiplayer games function right now. Uh, there's a lot of minutia of like, this game is only in beta versus like, mm. um, uh, the, the game is fully out. Sometimes a beta is super temporary. You don't get to keep anything you, you bought for some reason. That's not the case here. You do get to keep those things. Um, so I'm just... I, I don't know. Is it a strange move? Yeah, probably. But, like, at the same time, think of the pop they'll get uh, next year when they come back and Multiverses is back and the big push WB Games is going to give uh, the marketing team uh, for this game because they should. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I think it'll be a nice thing of, like, okay, players aren't playing our game anymore. They're not. The numbers are, are dwindling. There's nothing left. Uh, there's a, a fraction of, of our player base is still here. What can we do to, one, improve the game, get us out of our open beta, um, have a revamped progression system, take all of this feedback we've received where, you know, uh, players felt this way or that way about certain systems, incorporate those into the final game and fix it. Um, there probably is a, a, a backdoor reason as to why they can't keep the game open and fix the things that they want to fix. I don't know. I'm not a game developer, but I assume it's pretty hard. You know, when when something goes wrong here uh, during recording, I have to turn everything off and turn it back on again, you know? Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if multiverses kind of worked the same way, where they're like, hey, there, this is a core system of the game that we can't turn off without turning the whole game off. So we need to turn the whole game off. Um, but, you know, I, I think this will give them a better second wind than any multiverses chapter two, you mm -hmm. know, would would give them or, you know, a, a next wave DLC type thing would give them them saying, all right, we're going to pull it out because we were in beta, quote unquote. Um, and then we're going to come back, I assume, with more characters, I assume with better progression, I assume with um, tighter gameplay. I would hope. Um, and just a new arsenal of goodies for players to jump into, I would hope. And then, I, you know, I would also hope that this leads to success because I did enjoy Multiverses for the limited time I did play it. Uh, I played it for a very limited time. Um, but, you know, the, the content just wasn't really there for me to keep going. And maybe this is a way for them to do that. I doubt it. It's probably just going to be more of what they already had, plus a couple of extra characters and so forth. Um, but, yeah, we'll just have to kind of wait and see on that. Um, or, this is the worst idea in the world. Everybody <laughs> will have forgotten about multiverses. And by the time they come back, nobody's going to care. I guess we'll see how things play out then. Good for you guys. <laughs> best wishes for you guys definitely <laughs> moving on connor let, oh oh i messed up my ah i messed up my time code hold on there keep we go together, man. all right <laughs> you just tell me to keep it together man <laughs> connor, yeah yeah moving on, moving on to our third topic your second penny of the day what have you got here for us oh we got a nice article from windows central you all know a UK regulator narrows concerns on Microsoft's Activision deal for Xbox by Samuel Tolbert. Uh, console gaming is no longer a concern. Um, so you guys, it's, there's a what you need to know section. 
I think you've got that, that stuff that, that like, enough. if you've been following the story, like, it's right there. Yeah, just start with the, the paragraph here. Yeah. Uh, the saga of Microsoft's biggest acquisition ever may finally be beginning to wind down, with a major update from one of the big regulators. The CMA in the UK shared on Friday that it is updating its provisional findings, as there is no longer a cause for concern that Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard could cause competition cons concerns in gaming consoles. Quote, the CMA has received a significant amount of new evidence in response to its original provisional findings, the CMA explains. Having considered this new evidence carefully together with the wide range of information gathered before these provisional those provisional findings were issued, the CMA Inquiry Group has updated its provisional findings and reached the provisional conclusion that overall, the transaction will not result in a substantial lessening of competition in relation to console gaming in the UK. The CMA goes on to add that evidence is against that evidence is against Microsoft pulling Call of Duty from PlayStation after completing this acquisition. The CMA's concerns with cloud gaming remain, and a full report and decision is due by April 22nd, 26, 2023. Microsoft has been on a deal-making blitz the last couple of months, signing agreements for cloud gaming with companies like Ubitus, uh, Boosteroid, and NVIDIA, while agreeing to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo in the future. Uh... Windows Central take because let's give nah, it a we don't need the take we don't need the take we got he brought, us the, he brought us the article it's his personal take nah, no, no, no 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 just the facts just the like facts you're... thank you thank you Samuel for the facts um okay uh listen here's the first domino in a long line of them of of you know it's starting to fall it's starting to happen just like we've been predicting so for the last couple of months now or be expected. Um, of like, yeah, man, Sony, you can bitch and moan all you want, but you know, uh, like Thanos, the micro the microcision acquisitions, acquisitions, Microsoft acquisitions, uh, are inevitable. Um, cool. I mean, I mean, this is essentially everything that we've been saying. Of like, this doesn't, this doesn't monopolize the industry. This doesn't um, damage sales or console things anyway. Xbox is clearly willing to work with everybody to bring call of duty everywhere excuse me mm. Ooh, bit of Ooh, that one. i'm fighting it um i've i've lost my point <laughs> <laughs> uh Con connor to pick up here where were you uh well as you said we, we, we you were saying we knew it was coming uh this is the first big win though today or i should say it's the biggest win that microsoft has gotten because this could, as you said, start a domino effect because if the United States, uh, they look at what happened over here in the UK, they're like, well, I mean, which it's, it's the UK. They're like us. They're like our, <laughs> our over the sea neighbors. They like freedom and might, too. Yeah, right. Well, they they do now. Not when they tried to kill us all because that's what they almost tried to do. Remember? Um, yeah, but look, yeah, look, look, look how that look where that's gotten us. Anyways, that's a different <laughs> conversation. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, it's like woohoo. Blizzard's not going to be, uh, 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 who's the guy? I forgot his name all of a sudden. The CEO, the guy that everyone hates. Of Activision. Of Activision. You know, if you'd asked me any other day. If you'd asked me <laughs> no, any I'd... other day, Connor. What's his name? I'll Matt... Google it real quick. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. The, um, uh, the ABK not being run by, uh, a complete shithead anymore would be out. Uh, no, that's a different company. It's, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like. It's a really Bobby Kotick. That's who. It there is. it is. There Bobby it is. Kodak. Good job. All right, we need to we need to get his face on the thumbnail just so we all <laughs> remember who Bobby Kotick is. Yeah. Right. Um, interesting that they point out their their concerns for cloud gaming, um, which you know has secretly been Xbox's kind of secret weapon uh, for quite a while now. Where you know you can kind of play Xbox games wherever you want, however you want, uh, mm -hmm. which is really really interesting them having them being the ones hashing out deals to everyone i never thought of it as like oh wait cloud gaming is the next wave of technology that will push this industry and many others specifically anything involving tech uh to uh, the next level and microsoft being the the sort of leading steps or one of the leaders in that field and them handing out deals left and right kind of makes them the go-to guy for this so that's interesting that you know hey all right in the console space traditional gaming yeah this isn't a problem but when we start talking cloud gaming now things get a little more interesting so i think all of this uh talk about this activision blizzard thing has actually you know dusted up other issues that 
you know, weren't necessarily on everybody's radar until now. I also like that all of that talk Sony did blew back in their face and every legal representative is like, Sony, don't you guys like own everything? Like, wait a minute. Why are we talking about Microsoft when you guys are just kind of sitting here chilling? Should have been, should have been more careful there, Sony. Yeah, Sony just wants to keep more money in their pocket. We've always known it. Yeah, but I, I can't really blame them. But still, it's, it was futile. It was mostly futile. And there's still always a chance that they could have gone the other way and agreed with Sony's uh, you know, uh, criticisms of the deal. But clearly, they're not leaning that way now. Clearly. And then, Indeed. cleaning it up with our last topic of the day, my second penny. Uh, and uh, to wrap up the news, before we jump into our Resident Evil 4 review... Uh, there, there seems to be a, uh, a TMNT game, uh, coming sometime on the way. Mm-hmm. So, pulling an article from Polygon by Michael McWhorter, uh, beloved TMNT graphic novel The Last Ronin is becoming a video game. A new, very different style of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game is currently in development. An adaptation of The Last Ronin, the 2020 graphic novel that told a grim, futuristic story about the turtles... Uh, like the comic, the last Ronin video game adaptation will be a darker, more mature take on the typically colorful ninjas, according to Doug Rosen, Senior Vice President for Games and Emerging Path at Paramount Global. The rights holders for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in a third, in, or in an interview with Polygon last week, uh, Rosen likened the upcoming third-person action role-playing game to Sony's recent God of War titles and said it will be authentic to the story of the last Ronin arc, which is set in a future where only one of the turtles has survived. While other team and T games like last year's Shredder's Revenge are typically playing all four turtles, the last Ronin will be primarily a single character game. Though Rosen uh, posited that other characters could be playable in flashback sequences similar to how the comic series plays out, the primary action is said to center on the only surviving turtle. And then the rest of the article gets into spoilers about uh, the graphic novel, which uh, I will let y'all read as much as you want on your own time. Uh, I read it, so I know what happens. Um, oh, you do? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting stuff. Uh, I, I do vaguely remember this comic, like, you know, bringing some people up, and, like, people were excited about it back in the day when it was coming out. Um, I couldn't tell you anything else besides that, because I'm not a huge Ninja Turtle fans, like fan. I like the Turtles. Uh, but just this, this sounds legit to me. Like, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Please finish. Okay. Well, this sounds legit to me. Clearly, it's uh, the the Paramount guy Rosen here is clearly like, oh yeah, you know, we're going big this time. We're making a big AAA thing. It's gonna be like God of War. You kids like the God of War, right? You like when things are dark and gritty, right? Um, but when you actually think about it, sit down and think about it, that actually sounds pretty fucking dope. Um, you know, you think of like maybe some stealth mechanics, maybe some really cool action mechanics where you can pull off some, some cool combos and so forth, switching weapons, like on the D pad, very like, you know, camera over the shoulder type thing. Uh, I think, I think that sounds really, really good. And if the story is good, which, you know, from what I heard from, uh, comic book fans and, you know, from what I heard of the response that this announcement got, uh, we're, I think we're in for something kind of cool here. So I just thought it would be interesting to just bring this up and talk about it. It's not like news news, but it's really cool, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's just something to kind of be excited about. Connor, where, uh, does this do anything to, to, to churn your butter? You know, I was never... I watched the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when I was younger, but I wasn't like as big into it as other people were. Like I enjoyed it to a, a, a pretty well amount. So I, it, despite not being super familiar with it, it was always cool, of course. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, of course, down for this. Now, the question I've been thinking about is, they keep referring to it as one of the turtles is uh, the only one left alive. In the uh-huh. comic, because they're being vague here, in the comic is it vague as to who it is as well? Like it could be it, any it, of them? It, it is, the, the way the article, because the article g- gives it out, the, the, they basically hold their cards close to the chest until the very end, and then they reveal who, who it is. Uh, That's very cool. Yeah, so yeah. I assume we're going to be playing most of the game. And then, like, he's using all of their weapons. So you don't, and he's wearing a black mask. Like, they, they hide him, like, you know, yeah. so you're not 100% sure who it is. Um, 
he's not as happy or like his usual self. Oh yeah, no, he's like really guy. emotionally scarred or something, uh-huh. you know. So, uh, you know, again, like you can just do a quick Google search or read the comic, and you can find out who it is. I just, you know, I just read the rest of this article here, and they told me, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and uh, so yeah, it'll it'll be very 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 interesting. I think it'll honestly be likened pretty closely to sure probably god of war because that's they're drawing that as their main inspiration but like i think of like segments of batman arkham knight which i know you haven't played connor um but there's a lot of like flashback sequences where we explore the origins of the arkham knight and you know if you don't know now it's just red hood arkham knight is just red hood uh so jason todd and all that and uh wait who's wait who is that (laughs) uh but there was a lot of um sort of like intrigue and a lot of really cool presentational stuff with that with like how the flashbacks were handled it was like really dramatic and just emotional and so forth so i could really see this being adapted into a video game really really well um on top of the fact that like you know ninja turtles have always played well in games you know for the most part i mean granted not all the games are great but like when they are good they're good you know Um, very often they're not but you know when they are they are well, I, now, who do you think is developing it? That, the that is the, the next big question, isn't it? Um, mm-hmm. And you just kind of have think... to, look, to look at the board and go, who's, who's open right now? Who's, who's free right now? You know? And it's, it's tough. I don't, think any of the, I don't think it's any of the PlayStation guys. No. Because um, I just... No, I think, I think PlayStation would rather just be generating their own content because they already have other ip like spider-man and so forth Mm -hmm. and i don't know if the turtles are really gonna like if you think of like like if you're gonna put a character on a box like the turtles are cool but do they really bring up that much intrigue Mm -hmm. so i could see it kind of being like a one-off studio or like a like a solo studio who partners up a lot so you have to sit back and like i'm i'm lost like i have no idea it could be i mean like I would have said Insomniac if they didn't already say that they've got a Wolverine game coming. So I think Insomniac's plate is full, you know, of course, with Spider-Man 2 and, and Wolverine. Um, uh, I mean, because it's a dark and gritty thing, I could maybe see a Naughty Dog working this. But I think Naughty Dog is more interested in uh, telling their own stories and mm-hmm. making their own worlds and so forth. Um, and also, they just got off of The Last of Us, so... I imagine, and they just continuously keep going back to The Last of Us with the multiplayer game, part two, part one remake, the show. Um, So I imagine they'd rather not do something dark and gritty for once. Um, Santa Monica Studios, we know, is working on another game. We just don't know what that is. So, you know, if you're going to do God of War, you might as well do the guys from God of War. But I don't, I don't, again, like, I just don't, I don't see a PlayStation Studios game doing that unless it's one of the smaller guys like Ben Studio um Mm -hmm. which now i'm now at that rate you have to start wondering "Mm, is the talent really going to match the ip at that point Mm -hmm. and i don't know if it does uh and then when you jump out from there that's when it gets really tricky i don't see nintendo doing anything uh it could be any of the xbox guys who's who's on xbox lately that's nobody nobody's put out a game everybody's put out a game um so yeah, about, uh, go ahead. ID Software, possibly. ID, yeah. ID is uh, what are they doing right now? It is it is Doom, huh? But they seem to stop that now, or at least to, I think they have. But who knows? Yeah, yeah, I don't. Yeah, well, with Doom Eternal a few years ago, I just don't know. I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if I would assign ID to to that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't think of it either. But I'm not opposed to it. But I'm. Because they they understand systems really well, um, and it would be interesting to see them like try and craft a narrative. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the Doom games have you know, the the Doom games have like the same thing that I say FromSoft games have, where it's all lore. It's not really a story. It's just kind of things that are happening. Mm-hmm. Um, it like the story is not the purpose of those games. Um, it's just kind of there if you want to dig for it and, and figure out what's going on. Um, Oh, God, but in that same boat, let me think. Arcane's doing Redfall right now. Yeah. But that's yeah, I, that's Arcane, the other one. 
What is main arcane doing? The guys who just did death loop. That would Nothing be. I don't think we know that yet. That would be. Ooh, ooh, Connor, an arcane teenage mutant ninja turtle game. <laughs> that might be pretty cool. But if it's going, see, the thing that might kind of, I don't see possibly why that might be them is because they're saying it's going to be like God of War in the combat, which I just don't see Arcane really wanting to take on something like that specific. Was it in and, and with they, they when they don't really use that kind of stuff? It's kind of, yeah, right? I don't know. God of War Light could take on many different models, so that's why it could be that. Even if he, and that might not even be a daunting thing for them. They'd be like, okay, we can, we can make an action game. It's just an action game. It shouldn't be too difficult. Where, where did they say that? Where was the God of War quote? I'm trying to. There it is. Okay. Uh, in an interview, Rosen likened the upcoming third-person action role-playing game to Sony's recent God of War titles, and said it will be authentic to the story of the Last Ronin arc. I mean, I think that's full. The the thing about it is, is like God of War is not a stealth game, and with a ninja ninja turtle, stealth has to be a mechanic, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, which plays into Arcane's boat. Now, granted, Arcane has only done first person games, but I don't see why they can't, you know, venture out and do a third person thing. And I think that would work for them. Uh, Tango GameWorks, maybe hot off of uh, <laughs> Ghostwire Tokyo and. Uh, um, uh, the new one from this year, uh, Hi-Fi Rush, um, third-person action games. That's kind of their thing. Evil Within, uh, you know, is in that similar tone, sort of. So you can kind of seeing that it wouldn't be as mechanically um, sharp as I would probably hope for. But you know, maybe maybe if you know they're pulling new talent and so forth, I could see that happening. Um, Honestly, who I would like to be curious about it, they're not they're not doing it because they're busy doing other stuff now. EA Motive. <laughs> uh, off of really? the Dead Space remake, oh, which yeah. is which takes a lot of likings from from God of War with the single take camera and sort of just the over the shoulder action adventure stylings. Excuse me. Uh, I think that would be a really interesting team to do it. Obviously, probably not them because they found all the success with Dead Space. They're working on an Iron Man game now, and then they're probably doing more Dead Space after that. Um, <laughs> with, the, with the huge success that Dead Space has seen this year, um, so I don't know. It, it's a good question. Who who are you putting money on, or who would you like to see do this the most? And to me, it'd be Arcane. If Ar- if Arcane made a Ninja Turtle game, oh my god, I'd be there day one. I honestly have no clue. It's gonna be really. Like, I don't know who else is really available right now because all, all the ones that I would maybe go with, like I would think Machine Games, but they got the Indiana J- Jones yeah. game coming out. Yeah, they're working on Indiana Jones, and you assume Wolfenstein is coming again back around at some point. <laughs> yeah, that'd be on their their back end possibly, yeah. or most likely. Uh, well, we'll have a lot of time to to theorize after games start releasing, and we don't we, hear. We will indeed, and we'll have to. Uh, is this something that gets announced at at E uh, three time? Is this going to be what Ubisoft is working on? Uh-huh. <laughs> Oh my, it's like, we added another game that we will never finish to our laundry list. Oh, Jesus Christ, please stop. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for the news uh, for this week. But don't go anywhere. We're about to jump right into our review for Resident Evil 4, the remake. So please stick around for that in 3, 2, 1. What's poppin', players? Welcome back to a Two Penny Games review, this time for Resident Evil 4, the remake. Uh, I am your host, Tavin Bothell, here with my good friend and co-host, say hello to the people, Connor Elliott. Hello, people. Hello, people. Ladies and gentlemen, Resident Evil 4 is out. It's here. It was probably my most anticipated game for this year right now, or at least like top three easily most anticipated game. And uh, I, I played the whole thing over the weekend. Over the course of two days, I put 20 hours in and uh, just crushed it. Um... And I've got a lot of thoughts uh, on it. Connor, tell me uh, about how many hours, if you know, or if you have an idea in, are you? Well, unfortunately, Tevin, I don't have the same dedication to the podcast as you do, because I did not play it for 20 hours straight. No. I played it whenever I could, which was basically all my free time, because I'm I'm really been digging this game after just getting through the Village Chief boss fight. Uh, I did it right before this podcast, so my, it's still fresh in my mind as being a boss fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, you're a D's, you're probably what eight ish hours in. 
Eight is probably a good number, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know what, ladies and gentlemen? My experience with Resident Evil 4 uh, is a bit of a tricky one. First off, I don't recommend binging it like I did. <laughs> because mm-hmm. the whole game is a blur i think you should really savor this game and take your time with it so connor i think you're doing the, doing it right by that it's just savor i also it, take your time enjoy it all that i also have to especially do that when i'm because i'm on hard hardcore mode in this oh game are you really difficult. okay mm-hmm. yeah i just played on i played on standard difficulty or whatever um and to 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 get to the meat of it here resident evil 4 remake is a tried and true remake unlike anything we've really seen in the past couple of iterations of remake it doesn't offer you a new game experience like resident evil 2 or resident evil 3 gave you uh and it doesn't go sort of off the rails like final fantasy 7 remake gives you it's more aligned to sort of a dead space remake um but just gives you a whole lot more it uh expands on the story it regulates the tone and um gives huge quality of life updates to its gameplay and uh to its level design and sort of just sharpens up and refreshes and and refines everything that was great about resident evil 4 from back in the day and everything that doesn't really hold up as much has all been improved here i think when you talk about me specifically who is a huge resident evil fan but resident evil 4 was never like my go-to title uh i i don't necessarily feel revolutionized by Resident Evil 4, I actually just feel like um, I, the things that I liked about the original game, I love here, and the things that I didn't like in the original game, I just find tolerable, if just slightly annoying now. Um, so overall, just a huge push-up in quality. Uh, gameplay is really the 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 king of all kings in this game. The gameplay sings from beginning to end it's always fun from whether you're fighting your average normal villagers at the beginning of the game to the batshit antics that happen at the end of the game it's always fun whereas in the original game i thought the island was pretty bad in this one i actually kind of enjoyed the island it it's very different from the rest of the game still um and probably still not my favorite part of the game but it's still like it's now fun to me like i enjoyed going through it and seeing all of its level gimmicks and uh the boss fights that played out which i thought were trash in the first game here actually holds my favorite boss fights in the game <laughs> is, yeah i was at the end i was curious because it seems like it's a i forget the name kruber kruger krauser krauser i'm assuming he's one of them oh yeah oh yeah he's yeah, great yeah, yeah, i think I he's it. he's seems a like perfect example of of what this game holds where like initially the Krauser fight happens twice. Right. And at first it's a cutscene with quick time events in the original game, which is now turned into a parry fight where you're fighting each other knife V knife. And it's like kind of tense and, and a really good uh, test bed. It's sort of an appetizer for the full on fight that happens later, which is awesome. So good. It's literally, it went from, one of my one of the most annoying fights in the original game to my favorite fight in this game. I love it so much. Um, speaking of the parry mechanic, um, I'm a little like half in, half out on where I enjoy having it as a, I, ha- I enjoy having it as an opportunity to get myself out of a tough situation if I get cornered and a uh, bad guy starts swinging on me. But I often found that like if I didn't need to counter, I wouldn't counter, and I would often just kind of take the hit. Um, I'm right or, there with you. or like force my way into like scoring a headshot or something. I just often found myself forgetting that it was even an option. Now, near the end of the game, I started using it a lot more, um, and <laughs> to crazy effects in some cases. So maybe it was just like a, a mind adjustment thing that I just needed to remember, like take myself out of the mindset of the original game and put myself into this one. But just overall, like the counter is nice. I appreciate that it's there, but it's not the most necessary thing in the world. And I don't think it's like the most satisfying thing to do either. Like it's functional. Like it's not like a Sekiro counter where like you get like heavy ting, 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 and you feel real good every time you do it. It's just kind of like, okay, I did it. Like type feeling. Yeah. I I did the counter. It's still, I think it's still, of course, really cool. It'd be nice if they continue to have that, but true, it was just uh, it's something that I just would always think to myself after I got hit. It's like, oh, I should have used the parry, and yeah. 
that, I think that's really 100% all account. of my experience of the game of like oh wait i didn't need to get hit there i could have parried yeah <laughs> and with ha- being on hardcore i should probably do that more because even normal enemies take down your health pretty fast so uh, i believe I, you, I think yeah. it is a change of mindset that's needed uh one other thing the big other addition the stealth mechanics of the game yeah it, oh really not as hot on them as you were no. as yet, i thought you'd be i mean they're there I mean, <laughs> they are it's a thing you can do and it's really just like like it's just an opportunity to kind of like like uh uh you thin know, the herd. shrink thin the herd like mm-hmm. you'll take down one two maybe three guys and then alarms will go off and you got to start shooting everybody but i often found myself feeling like this just takes up a lot of unnecessary time like it, it doesn't make a difference like it's not like a stealth game like um you know i think of uh machine gun games uh wolfenstein uh the new the new lineage of them where like if you stealth your way through those games, you can clear entire you can clear entire encounters without getting caught and reinforcements never come and it's just a good time. Here, yeah, sure, I'll take out one or two or three guys, but then like doors burst open and six more Las Plagas come into the room and I'm like, all right, well, now I'm just gonna go guns blazing and it was like I never even did the stealth anyway. <laughs> so it wasn't a big thing for me, but did it work for you? Yeah, I, I felt like especially during my hard encounters, because I, I, I have, I've only had two, three boss fights in the game um, up to this point. The, I'll just say it because everyone knows Resident Evil 4. The, the giant, the giant salamander and uh, the father, the village, um, I can call him the father, uh, <laughs> the village chief. Yeah. Um, but I never really died, except for the salamander for some reason. I never really died all that much. Not oh, at all wow. in the village elder's case. But I found myself dying so much over and over again. Like the opening bell, uh, the opening segment when mm-hmm. you're, you know, the bell rings to take them away, but you have to hold them off. That one was incredibly difficult. Holding the house with Luis was extremely difficult. I was like, at one point, like, really? how do I, how do I, you know, get through this encounter? Interesting. But I was able to. It, you know, it never felt like it was cheap. It just really yeah. would hit you up against the wall. See, I'm and having it, the I had the opposite thing where the boss fights mm-hmm. were really hard for me, but the main gameplay was usually fine. Uh, I did. I I will say this is the hardest Resident Evil game. I think ever like this game is kind of tough in, in moments like it'll mm-hmm. it'll kick your ass like it will punish you for fucking up. Uh, which I really, really enjoy because it's more ac- action centric. So like to have the challenge there keeps it alive for me and keeps it interesting for me. Um, I've always said I always find Resident Evil more interesting when it takes place in a central location uh, like the Spencer Mansion, like the RPD. Um, so and whenever they expand out and go more atrix- action centric, they lose me a little bit. So this isn't my favorite Resident Evil, but I don't think it ever really had a chance to be my favorite. Um, but it's definitely just so high quality that it's man, it's up there. It's right there. Like top three, top two uh, for sure. I, I got to say it's uh, <laughs> you might be upset at this, mm. but. Yeah, I think it is the best Resident Evil that I've played. Oh, no, I'm not mad now, about that at all. I, no, well, I should say that. that. That's not what you'd be angry about. My second favorite, close up to it, is Resident Evil 5. Not <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy 5 so much, and this one is pretty similar to it in the sense that it's very combat heavy, but yeah. leagues better. You know, I can objectively say, not the best game. And nah. the story and the tone of this one's way better. Oh, it yeah. actually creeps you out at certain points. Mm-hmm. You know, it's... Resident Evil still really trying to keep with that horror aspect to it you know two and three obviously had it and this one though they obviously like you said action focused it still has that scary element to it it's it's where it's where i kind of wish resident evil had stayed you know with with (laughs) resident evil 4 the original it got really campy and really cartoony and while this game is still campy it doesn't go cartoony it doesn't uh like become like just these cartoon characters come to life, like making jokes all the time and nothing is taken seriously. You're laughing at the game more than you're like, Oh, from the game Mm -hmm. here. It's much more like you're not scared, but you are, there is like a little creep. Like it'll make your hair stand up a little bit every once in a while. And you'll go, Oh, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. Or you'll find, and you'll find coming up on the castle uh, segment. There are characters on the later end of the game where you're like, ew, Ew. Hmm. Oh, I really don't like you. Whereas before you were like, all right, what kind of joke character is this? But now you're like, oh, you're gross and <laughs> disgusting. And um, 
I think a lot of the character work in this game is actually pretty good for a Resident Evil game. Um, you know, it's not like The Last of Us level of storytelling or character work here. But they do interesting things with, with these characters that I think um, has potential for sequels or future remake games. I think specifically, surprisingly, Ashley is actually an interesting character in this game. Um, where I would like to see her again in future Resident Evil titles. Um, even if she was to, let's say, replace one of those side characters that we see in Resident Evil 5 or Resident Evil 6. I don't think she should replace Sheva, but do we really need Helena? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, so I think I think we could find sort of an interesting balance with that. And, and I think this game really just gives a whole lot of potential and a lot of intrigue that I have for what comes next. Um, even though I, I fully enjoyed and loved everything that I had here. The expanded, uh, there's expansion on some levels. Uh, a lot of the level design kind of remains pretty true. Um, but, you know, in the areas where it was weaker, they expand on or make it more complex or add new levels to it, um, which is really, really appreciated, especially in the later parts of the game. And, um, you know, um, some of the story elements have been expanded upon and things that were always like sort of just kind of referenced or maybe said in a offshoot piece of media like a comic book or a uh, animated movie or something gets addressed here in game in some way shape or form there's a lot of character inspiration from um like return of the jedi emperor palpatine like type inspiration from stuff which is really really cool um characters when you're fighting when you're the bosses that you fight the boss fights and stuff as you progress in the fight like their character dialogue becomes more desperate and they start showing you shades of who they really are inside and stuff which i thought was really really fascinating this game just has a lot more substance than the original game had it, it there's a lot more meat on the bone uh, that I really, really like and I really, really appreciate. Um, as someone who enjoys Resident Evil 4, the original, uh, I can say, like, I really, really like... I really, really like this one. I want to say I love it, but I have to sit with it for a little longer before I do. Um, one thing, and this is just for me, uh, I don't like this trophy list. Um, it requires a bunch of playthroughs, which at first I was like, oh, yeah, not a problem. But the way they've set up their New Game Plus systems, it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like it It like the checklist of things it wants you to do isn't like a, oh i have to do all this right now like i did with resident evil 2 or resident evil 3 where i had a lot of fun just replaying and redoing things quicker this one is just kind of like a hey a lot of like if you like this game you're probably going to replay it a couple of times here's some cool stuff you can do when you do eventually replay it so it's like a game that like i'll keep on my dashboard for a long time but i'm not like going to jump right into my new game plus right away with that but that's just me mm -hmm. um i'm seeing a lot of like resident evil fans on twitter be like oh no i've beaten the game four times already and i'm like oh jesus christ a lot of these people are journalists who have had the game for you know a couple of weeks um but i'm like oh fuck man holy cow um, while I'm looking at the B footage here, which Connor, you can't see, maybe I should have switched it over, but, um, the merchant, um, is cool. Like he, he plays pretty much the sim same, similar things. Uh, I liked him more in the original, uh, something about the line delivery in this one just wasn't, wasn't in love with. Not as uh, snappy though. I do like the references. He's like, Oh my back. The years yeah. haven't been kind to us, I suppose. Yeah. So I did kind of add that element of like, almost like he was a dimensional being or something like that so yeah even though i agree the original performance was more captivating with his voice lines this one not as much yeah so still like i said done well and then Especially are you the doing he are you doing all the like side stuff uh, as i see them yeah as you see them okay but you're not like hunting them or whatever yeah no yeah i, I was doing you. i was doing a lot of like get all the treasures complete you know oh, yeah. as many quests as i could i i missed a quest early on in the village and it like i had accidentally progressed past the point of no return and i was like ah damn it because i was really hoping of getting that completionist trophy of like get everything in one run but i messed it up early so i was like all right never mind um mm -hmm. uh, but i do enjoy i just enjoy that they're there they're really small simple stuff of like literally like go go shoot all the blue medallions like from the original game go shoot some rats you know go shoot three rats in a factory you go all right sell cool. some vipers yeah 100 percent. you know or, or sell me some fish or something you're like 
Okay. All right. Sure. So like, they're not like substantial, but they're fun and they're good ways to get um, more resources for trading and and selling items and so forth, which is all appreciative and nice. Um, the shooting ranges are really good. I like the shooting ranges a lot. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, and they get Very they get fun. more complex and more fun as they go on, and some of them get kind of tough um, to hundred percent. That is. Um, and then I liked. Ring. I liked I like all the like the like small things that they've done like with the attaché case and the little like charms you get to like give you like little in-game bonuses and so forth. Those are all fun little cute little things that they've added to just kind of um sort of add more of a build. It's really light. It's literally like, oh hey, you get 20% more ammo when you craft for hun- handgun bullets or uh hey with this attache case you find more red herbs out in the wild than you would Mm. normally and i go all right cool i appreciate that cool it makes a difference yeah um but it's not like you know i'm not like cheesing the game you know the game is still the game um connor talk to me how are you feeling about all this gameplay stuff man you liking it a lot oh yeah i'm loving it and i it's very similar to resident evil 2 it's that foundation but it's a lot more tight which it makes sense because resident evil 2 was a big on the survival element of things, scrounging for ammo, every little shot counts. And this Which one I personally you... like more, but I did like this one more because ammo management can be, uh, it's not bad, but I just like being able to shoot my gun at these uh, waves of enemies and be really in these really tense situations. Cause frankly, fighting zombies in Resident Evil two would kind of get boring. Wow. <sighs> and these ones, there's a lot more, just the enemies are a lot more active and more of a threat. So it, you know, that, that higher pa- pace combat that comes with it, I just prefer slightly more, which maybe lends to the point of me liking Resident Evil 5 as well. Yeah, but, th- um, I'm I'm 100% the opposite way. Don't, don't know, get me yeah. wrong, I, lo- I really, really like this game, but, like, it's 100% like, I don't know, man, I got to the castle and I started shooting dudes in the head and I was like, this yeah. is the exact same stuff I was doing before, like, and nothing's mm-hmm. changed, where, like, mm-hmm. you're just, you know, mowing down mobs of enemies, whereas, like, in Resident Evil 2, every single zombie was a threat. You know, yeah. In this one, it's like, all right, what's twenty villagers? Nothing. Like, okay. Yeah, but you you also see that with Leon, like just comp- how he compares in these two new remake games. You you can tell, like, he's so okay, good. This guy actually, one, huh? he's he so is good. very good. He's so cool. Yeah. He is. He's like he's he's done a complete one eighty of a character, and it makes sense after what we saw in Resident Evil Two. You definitely get tough from that. Well, even uh, even if you go back and like watch or play Resident Evil Two, um. Like, there is an arc, and it makes sense, and it tracks. Whereas, like, in the original game, it didn't track. Like, these were two, there was a Resident Evil 2 Leon character, and there's a Resident Evil 4. This one, it's like, oh, in Resident Evil 2, he was still doing the puns. He's, he was mm-hmm. still doing the, the quips and the one-lines. But, you know, they weren't as good, and they weren't as often. Uh, and here, they're still not good, but, like, there's, like, it's a cheesy not good, as opposed to, like, a, ugh, I can't believe you just said that. It's a, really, Leon? All right, you little scoundrel, you. Um, but, yeah, I, yeah, I like that a lot. I kept in that nice goofiness. Where did everyone go? Bingo. It's that dog. <laughs> it's that dog. Uh, <laughs> oh, did you, I saw a little clip on Twitter. Did you know that if you have the sniper rifle in the beginning area of the village, when all the way them come at you waves, you could shoot the bell and have it ring and end that scenario early. That's how these speedrunners do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh man, you, you just changed the... the whole intro of the game for me. <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to get on the roof to do it, but you can see it, and you you could do it with other ones, but it's of course way easier with the sniper, which I thought was pretty cool. That's so cool. That. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. One thing I really appreciate about this game is they know all the things you as a player did in the original game. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. For example, in that early village area there's a big tower that you climb up and when you climb up, you know, a lot of, a lot of players can kind of like camp that ladder and just kind of shoot dudes off the ladder or whatever. They've made it to where if you step off of that landing, you just fall right back, right. You fall through the floor. Um, so you can't camp up there anymore. And I'm like, that's cute. That's really clever that you did that. Um, and it got me. Yeah. I, I, I think the biggest thing I can say is, is for players who have never played resident evil four before, uh, can get an accurate feeling of what it must have felt like to play the game when it came out originally. Mm-hmm. Because when... That fresh perspective. Yeah, when fans of the original game talk about it, I don't get it. Like, I just don't feel the thing. God damn it. <laughs> oh, Sorry, it's, uh... I'm a little sick, so I'm getting over some, some sickness. Um, when fans of the original game talk about what they used to feel playing that game for the first time, 
I never understood it. They're always like, oh, man, it's so crazy and hectic and, you know, low-key kind of scary and fun and, and and exciting. I never really got that in the original game, playing it 15 years later. But now, now I do. Now it does make sense to me because it is creepy. It is hectic. I do feel like I'm getting swarmed from every angle. I, I always feel like I'm on the cusp of tipping the power balance, but I'm never quite there. Like, the enemy is always just a little tougher than, um, I, I would, uh, just a little tougher than, than I am, you know, mm. to where, to where it's like, oh, I have to try. Like, I always have to try. Whereas in the original game, I felt very quickly turned into, oh, I'm more powerful than them. I'm just bang, 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 bang all the time. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. Easy and done. Yep. Um, I will say they added some gameplay twists to a couple of different enemy types, um, which I personally found kind of annoying. Um, specifically, very specifically, I'm talking in the castle when the dudes are start wearing the robes. The red robed guys are fucking annoying as shit. Um, Why so? Do you, do you want me to tell you or? <laughs> like, sure, I don't really care about so. That little detail. So the Las Plagas is is a whole mechanic in the game where like heads will pop and then a giant monster will come out and you got to kill the monster or whatever, right? Yep. Uh, the red guys in the castle have like a little lantern and they start doing chants and stuff, which will, because Leon is infected with Las Plagas, give Leon a headache. No, no, no. So he'll stop and twitch and be like, oh God, like, and you'll, you'll, he'll like flinch and you'll lose precious seconds in, in the middle of a combat. Um, it also activates some of the Las Plagas in the other enemies around you. Uh -huh. So like heads will start popping left and right all around you as you're, you know, suffering from your headaches. So everything just gets really hectic. And they have the habit of every time they put a red guy in a room, it's waves and waves of dudes. I'm talking like 20 dudes in one room. And I'm like, it's just too much. And I found it really, really annoying and frustrating. Um, it's going to be hard when I have to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, focus. Focus the red guy. Always focus the red guy. Real oh, I'll hard. bring out my, I'll bring out my gun. Hit him right yeah. where you bring out your guns. Yeah. Bring out my guns. Yep. <laughs> Give him the old pow wow. Uh yeah. So that I found annoying, but it like as soon as I was past it, I was having fun again. But like there would always be there's these moments of frustration in this game. Um in our uh hype after the hype review for God of War 3, I believe, Phil talked about Rage Gate moments. And this game has a lot of Rage Gate moments where it's just a bunch of areas that sort of test the player. And we're just going to throw a, more than they're capable of handling right now just to sort of like level them up in their minds, like get their more acclimated and stuff. There's a lot of that in this game. And I, I kind of found some of it kind of annoying after a while. And it was just like, why are we spiking the difficulty here for no reason? Like, it's just a room of dudes. If it was a boss fight, that's one thing. Like, the Salazar boss fight, I had a lot of I had a lot of problems with. But because it was a boss fight, I was more willing to accept its bullshit, even though I was really mad at it at the time. But as soon as I, like, you know, you memorize combat patterns, you, you know, you get sort of a rhythm of how the boss moves. It's very from software in that, in that sense. Um, what's interesting is, is, like, I don't know if the original game had this. It doesn't feel like it did. It kind of felt like it was kind of doing its own thing. But this game wears its influences on its sleeve, I feel. Like, where it's very... Uh, like, it takes a lot of influence from from soft games. Uh, you know, like your, your Dark Souls and stuff in terms of, like, tone, I think. And sort of um, aesthetic a little bit. Um, it, takes, it takes a lot of influence from Metal Gear. I think specifically Metal Gear Solid 3... Um, and sort of just the Kojima-ness of the game's tone and sort of um, how the action plays out and how the character designs are. Um, and uh, how goofy the characters are, where they're taking themselves seriously, but, you know, they're being campy and goofy at the same time. It's very Kojima. Um, and uh, I, I think on a gameplay level, they pull a lot of uh, interesting influence from games like The Last of Us. Um, specifically in its UI, of course, where its UI is very Last of Us, but um, just the way sort of the guns handle and the guns feel kind of feels like I'm playing The Last of Us 2 again, um, which I thought was really, really interesting. Whereas, like, the original game kind of feels like its own thing, um, mostly because it was, like, experimenting with third-person cameras and third-person action shooter games uh, when there really wasn't anything like that back in the day. 
uh, and now that genre has been well established. So now it's just let's take the best parts of all of these great games and shove them into one. And turns out you just get a really good game out of that, regardless. I'm certainly addicted to playing it right now. I'll continue to do that until I beat it. And Phil has also started as well, didn't he? Yeah, I think he's just gotten past the village segment. Like, he's not, he's, or like the the first village fight or whatever. Like, he's not very far in it. But, you know, like Resident Evil's not his big thing. But, you know, I think he's enjoying the gameplay uh, updates as opposed to the original game where he was not in love with that. Um, But, yeah, uh, I, I think what's funny is, is like the Dead Space remake, I think, replaces the original game. Um, and I think this one stands next to the original game. Like, like pick whichever one you want to play first to play first. It doesn't matter. Um, but it is interesting to go back and compare and contrast these two games. Whereas Dead Space, just play the remake, you know, Mm -hmm. like they're, they're like, you can go back and play the original if you want, but it's more fun to play the remake. Whereas this one, like, if you're like, Hey, I just beat the remake how is it in comparison to the original? I'd say, well, go play it. It's on everything. So, you know, and it's still fun and, you know, kind of mostly holds up, you know, just be prepared for a step backwards. But, you know, I I think it's still perfectly valid to go back and play that original game. So I have one last question. What's that? Which is better? Resident Evil 4 remake or Dead Space remake? That's a good question. Um... Two new horror games came back. Yeah. Um, I didn't even expect them to. Well, are you asking me, like, which should someone pick up first? Or are you asking me, like, just which one I liked more? Go with both. Which one do you like? First of all, which, which you like more? What would you think people would you recommend to people more? I, if you can even give it an answer at this time. Yeah, it, it, it's a tricky thing because it kind of comes down to taste. Um, I think Resident Evil 4 is a better game than the Dead Space remake because I think a lot of the Dead Space remake is still rooted in that 2000... When did that game come out? 7? 2008? Um, game design, um, which kind of you know holds it back a little bit, but that's still recent enough to where that original game still holds up. Mm-hmm. Whereas recommend- the original Resident Evil 4 doesn't hold up as well. Right. I think I liked Dead... I think I'm a personal fan of Dead Space more. Um, But I I did really, like... That's not to take away from this, but... Like, and I think when all is said and done, Resident Evil 4 will probably land higher on my top 10 of the year than Mm -hmm. Dead Space. Uh, I'd be surprised if it didn't. But um, I really, really enjoyed my time with Dead Space. I had a lot of fun with Dead Space. And I think Dead Space did more when you talk about its intensity director. It did more for survival horror as a genre than this game does. This game just gives you a really, really well-designed, well-polished survival action game um, or action horror game um, that's really, really fun to play. Um, It's also like... I spent so much time cramming for this review that I'm kind of sick of this game. Like, just looking at the B-roll footage right now, I'm kind of like, ugh, no more. Please, God, I'm done. Um, so I, I think I've just overdosed on Resident Evil 4 right now. Um, and if I had, back. Yeah, if I had slow-played it at my own pace that I would have liked, uh, I would probably would have would be um, much more excited about this than I am. But I don't get me wrong. I'm still excited. I still like this a lot. Like, it's... It's a damn good game. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, but at the same time, whereas you know, Resident Evil 2 offered you a completely new gameplay experience, this one just looks to refine the original game. So it's, it's a lot of like, okay, yeah, this is Resident Evil 4 in some parts. And for better or worse, where I still think the first third is better than the last third, um, even though the island is more fun now than it was. Um, but... You know, I still think, you know, I still think it's front loaded. Like all the fun is at the beginning of the game and then, it, you know, it kind of peters off near the end. Uh, I still think it's too long. Um, it's just now I don't have to go through six unnecessary mini bosses and weird gimmicky level design and um, uh, really bad 
uh, boss fights, like Krauser was a terrible boss fight in the original game, and now he's awesome. You know, now he's my favorite. So, you know, it's sort of a, you know, pick and choose uh, what you want, how you want. I just think this is overall just a great improvement from the original game. Uh, I, I really do like all the character work they did in this game. Uh, like, the story is still, like, it's a Resident Evil story, whatever. But, like, the characters are interesting. Ada Wong is interesting here. Whereas before I found her a little one note here, I'm like, oh, you're actually, like, you've got some intrigue in you. Uh, Luis is a great character in this game. Um, whereas before, again, last game I felt he was a little one note. Here, he's got some more depth to him. And, you know, his story is a little more tragic this time around. And I appreciated that. Um, Ashley, I talked about all of the villains uh, are really, really uh, layered uh, in the it. limited times you get to talk to them and so forth. Um, and any of the like gimmick things, quote unquote gimmick things, that uh, are carried over from the original here uh, to here, rather, um, they don't play so much as gimmicks anymore. Like they feel a little more intrinsic to the experience this time around. Excuse me. Um, I think of uh, the the mini boss fight where you have to you have to freeze him, the 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 really strong uh, enemy type that you just have to you have to freeze him up. That like it played like a gimmick in the original game, and here it it just kind of plays more naturally. Like it kind of makes sense here. So um, yeah, I'm as a fan of Resident Evil, I'm very happy with this game. Um, as someone who wasn't a huge fan of Resident Evil Four. This do, this did a hell of a lot to make me a fan of Resident Evil 4. And uh, I definitely think it's totally worth full purchase, play, you know, must play game of the year. Uh, you know, and it's... Um, when all is said and done and um, the dust settles, this game has a heavy, heavy um, chance at being my game of the year. We'll see where it actually lands, but, you know... Um, I'm I'm very very impressed with the quality of game we have here. Connor, anything else you want to add on uh, to your experience so far? Oh, you're muted, my friend. I forgot I had done that. Uh, not really. No, I I really like this game, and I'm still looking forward to finish it and see how the rest of the game plays out. Because from what you said, and from what the original game was, <laughs> the the same case, the first part first part of the game is the best. So when I actually played the other lesser good parts well maybe you'll have a different opinion maybe it, it, it won't be the, the gap is way smaller like instead of like mm. it being a huge gap it's a it's a much smaller gap in good. quality in my opinion i so. was trusting it huh i was trusting that it would be able to do that oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's it's a, it's it's a must play game especially for resident evil fans 100 percent um before we wrap up here connor uh of course everybody's big conversation piece around this game is what next what do we do next for Resident Evil? Do we just go for an RE9? Or do we remake Code Veronica, Resident Evil 0, Resident Evil 1, um, 5, 6? Where, where, where would you as a fan like to see them go next? I want to see what they do with 5. I'm assuming it's going to take on a very different thing, but I have to see it. I, I have to see what it's going to do. I kind of do too, especially because like 5 and 6 are not as beloved, so you can take more liberties with it. Like, mm -hmm. you don't need the exact same level design from 5, you know, back. You can, like, totally revamp it all. Uh, I think the only thing that needs to happen is co-op. It needs to have co-op. Mm -hmm. And I think with the Mercenaries mode, we have an opportunity to that's coming, uh, uh, like, in, like, two weeks. Um, we have an opportunity to kind of play around and experiment with co-op in Resident Evil 4 here. But literally, 5 with this tone and this gameplay... Oh, 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 that would be a game for the ages right there. Oh, I would love that so much. What if it's like Resident Evil 2 where you just choose which route you want to play, Sheva or Chris? That wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> um, on a mission. I would honestly... Get, uh, go ahead. And they get, like, separated and it's a whole big no, thing. No, Between characters that don't know each other. No, that you need the co-op. You need the co-op. Uh, I personally... I'm just not a fan of the more action-oriented... Let me rephrase that. I am a fan. But I like the more survival horror, Metroidvania level design esque type stuff more from Resident Evil games. So I would like a break from the action heavy title, and I would appreciate it if they went to, um, you know, uh, a, a Resident Evil Code Veronica, so that we could get Claire Redfield some more love because her representation in the franchise is severely lacking. 
Um, I would like, I would, I would enjoy a Resident Evil One remake. But you know, as we just reviewed the Resident Evil One remake from the GameCube era, um, uh, a few weeks ago, like I love that game, and you know, I don't necessarily want you know a, a different version of that yet. Uh, but if it was bundled with like a Resident Evil Zero. Resident Evil 0 and Resident Evil 1. I think that would be an interesting little combo piece that they could put together for us. Um, but I would like I would like us to jump to a more survival horror complex level design game and then come back to an action game um, and sort of bounce off from there. And then, you know, if we're going to do a Resident Evil 9 at some point, sure, I'd be down for that. But I don't know, like, that could go in any direction they want. They have, they, as you said, they do have liberty to do as yeah. they please. All I have for is that six, if it does happen, is just the same thing, but no co-op, and you take each of the characters having their own story. And take that out would be too much. That take out Jack. Be... You don't. You take out Jack. You take out Jack. And maybe no. even do different combos. I don't want that. There. I don't want that. <laughs> I want a co-op experience. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for your Resident Evil 4 review. Thank you so much for watching and listening along. If you are watching from the Two Penny Games cast, remember, you can catch this show every week live, mo- not live, every week Monday, 8 a.m. Central Time, youtube.com slash at Two Penny Games and mainstream podcast services of your choice. Remember to follow us on TikTok, Twitter, and um, Twitch, twitch.tv slash Two Penny Games, where we go live every Tuesday with uh, our good buddy Phil, goes live and plays some video games having some real gamer moments for you until next time have a great time and connor say goodbye to the people luego